Hi, welcome back. Welcome to Partnership Live, our monthly discussion with leaders in healthcare who are shaping New Jersey. I'm Marie Carl Vilsius Talti, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with the Vice President of External Affairs, Kenneth Morris Jr. from St. Joseph's Health. Hi, Ken, how are you? I'm doing well, Marie Carl. Such a pleasure to speak with you. I know that your title is Vice President of external affairs, but I think we should have like a little tagline that says international man of mystery. And I'm sure, you know, in our discussion, people will, will hopefully um, see why. We like to usually start off with a really simple question, just, you know, getting to know you. So if you were not in this specific position that you are now and making all the impact and change that you are making, um, what would you be doing? Actually, Marie, I probably would um, be playing jazz. You know, I've um, always loved jazz. I actually play um, uh, saxophone and flute, and I played in a jazz band um, oh, wow. throughout college, you know, as a way of helping to sort of pay down my tuition. <laughs> it's just my, my, my mom and my, my college costs. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if, uh, if I was to do anything differently, I'd probably be playing in a jazz band. But um, if you can choose a, a musician, famous or not, that you would like to play with, who would that have been? Or who would that be now? Oh, probably too. I would, would love to have been able to play with um, Charles Mingus or, or Wes Montgomery. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both phenomenal. Uh, musicians, you know, far ahead of their time, and particularly came to improvisation and, and really demonstrating the sort of the creative spirit around jazz itself, and just to sort of, you know, just to be in the same room with them, to be inspired by them, and, you know, not that I would I have the skill set or the chops as said in the industry to, you know, to, mm -hmm. to be on par with them, but would have really had loved them. Yeah. They'd be on stage with them. Oh, that's that's amazing. Music is very, very powerful. And hopefully we get to talk about that a little more. But I'd like to give our, our viewers um, a little insight as to why I called you International Man of Mystery. I know mm -hmm. that you had a really fascinating career path. Uh, you started very early on as a medical illustrator. Is that is that correct? That Can you correct. share a little bit about that? Certainly. Yeah. I mean, most folks, when I say medical illustrator they really you know that their eyes over glass over they have no <laughs> not stick no. figures no <laughs> right but um i actually started my career as a medical illustrator you know i graduated with a degree in art as well as in anatomy um and what i would do is when surgery was being performed um I would go into the surgical suite, I have all my surgical gowns and so forth, and I have a bunch of pencils all pre-sharpened, obviously no erasers because it couldn't contaminate the, um, the surgical area. And as the surgery was being done, I would sketch the procedures of everything that the surgeons were doing. Wow. That was done. I would then do finish illustrations of those procedures step-by-step, step, and then those illustrations would then use to teach uh, surgeons residents and others of how to do the procedures themselves. Uh, in addition, if there was a special technique or something that was discovered, you know, I would be tasked with sort of visually um, showing that technique. Um, I've been published in the New England Journal of Medicine and various other medical um, publications. Um, obviously, you know, that career is more centered around teaching hospitals. St. Joseph's Health is a, a major teaching hospital. Even though I started at was then College of Medicine and Dentistry in Newark, um, which was also a, a teaching facility, did an internship at um, uh, Beth Israel for a year as part of my, my training. So to become a medical illustrator, you literally take all the courses and classes that a medical student would take, except for clinical. Wow. I didn't touch patients, but <laughs> the anatomy, the physiology, and, and everything else. And... Um, uh, was in that capacity here at St. Joseph's for probably about 17 years before switching careers. Wow, that, that's really that's really amazing. I'd like to go back to that. But talking about medical illustration, I know earlier this year we had, uh, I believe his name is Chidadai, uh, 
Chin and I, eBay, who went viral for mm -hmm. the depiction and illustration that he did of a black fetus. And mm -hmm. that was all over LinkedIn, all over CNN, and just basically everywhere. And everyone was just so astounded just by the black and brown illustrations that are missing from the, the mm -hmm. medical books. And we know that representation is very important, especially in, in healthcare. Um, how do you see the changing narrative um, around just that illustration and that depiction of black and brown bodies changing the narrative around health and equity? Well, I think um, it really begins to pull back the curtain with regards to the some of the disparities that actually exist, you know, in healthcare. And I think it's fortunate that there's more of a realization now that, you know, um, those folks are people in the healthcare industry really need to begin to really take a look at, you know, the disparities and moving forward with developing sort of equitable solutions to address um, what has been historically, you know, marginalized um, populations. I mean, it's interesting that you say that because what actually got me into medical illustration is when I was in high school, I painted a picture of a black um, pregnant woman and I showed the fetus being developed inside the body. Oh, wow. And my high school art teacher at the same, you know, Mrs. Feinstein, who I, you know, I fondly remember, you know, said, have you ever thought about a career in medical illustration? Of course, I had no idea what it was. And then she assisted me in researching it. And then we found the school uh, out in Ohio that offered the program. So I think, again, as I said, you know, the, the illustrator that you spoke of really helped, you know, society as a whole, you know, focus on, you know, some of the disparities, disparities in healthcare, particularly when it comes to black and, black and brown people. Yeah. That, that is so interesting that you did that so long ago, but now with the proliferation of social media, they're like, oh my God, this is the first time this has ever been done. We should yeah. let them know. You Sorry. still have that picture? Maybe we could send it to them. <laughs> let them know that you started doing this prior yeah. to. So how did you transition from medical illustration and, and graphics to community and um, health administration, hospital administration? Well, I've been um, at St. Joseph's uh, a little over 42 years. So I've been here, you know, quite a while. And there was a, a change in leadership um, uh, several years ago, and the new CEO uh, had a focus on community outreach. Uh, he felt that there was a, a need given the communities that we served. Um, and at the time he knew I was very involved um, in the community. I sat on several community boards um, earlier in my career, the, the Patterson YMCA, um, the um, uh, um, Ethel Williams Scholarship Fund and so forth. Uh, I was from Patterson, I you know, lived and raised in Patterson. So he asked if I would be willing to take on the challenge of really beginning a community engagement program at the hospital. And he then tasked me with doing 50,000 um, blood pressure screenings within the first year. And I, I chuckled and I said, you want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> Just 50,000? And, and, and he says, yes. I says, well, you, you know, I'm a department of one, right? He says, well, you'll, you'll get it done. I, I have confidence in you. And um, I actually ended up doing about maybe 35,000 um, blood pressure screenings in partnership with the Patterson School District, uh, uh, faith-based groups, um, and barbershops and beauty parlors and, 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 you know, got it done. And, you know, I walked in and says, well, look, I didn't hit the 50. I, you know, I got 35 and he was, he was so impressed. He says, well, look, I would have been happy if you actually got 5,000. <laughs> you know, you know, he says, so, you know, yeah, that wasn't my expectation. But um, it was a definitely a, a transitional moment in my career. And I liken it to the fact that, you know, if you're on a team, if the, the coach asks you to play a different position, you know, you either play that position or you sit on the bench. So, and I didn't, didn't want to sit on the bench. So I, so I took on the challenge. <laughs> and Patterson is very lucky that you took on the challenge. 
Um, so I know you said there was a change of leadership that brought you into this role. So throughout your career within St. Joseph's Health, who was your mentor and work champion and to, to help you rise through the ranks and become an executive? Well, I, I actually had I had several, you know, throughout my career. And I would say there was um, there was an, an African-American dentist at, at the time, uh, Dr. Harris, who I kind of really kind of looked up to because um, when I started um, in this field, there weren't really many people of you know, color, particularly, you know, um, and as physicians and so forth. Um, there was also a Dr. Robinson. Uh, who sort of was in medical leadership, um, who, who, who also was a dentist, as a matter of fact, uh, who I kind of looked up to and sort of met me throughout. And then there was Sister Jane Francis Brady, who was the, the long-term serving CEO of, uh, of St. Joseph's for a while, well-known throughout the state of New Jersey on her healthcare advocacy and so forth was a force to be reckoned with. And I, I, I definitely admired her um, as well. So I had, I had several, several folks that sort of kind of, I'd like to kind of walk in their shadows. <laughs> and I, I'm sure you are. And how are you um, helping others come through the ranks? Or do you have any specific programs at St. Joseph Health or, or is it just you as an individual reaching out to people in the community? Well, I think what had happened, because I served on the, the city council in Patterson for about 16 years, um, three consecutive years as the, the council president. And I was an at-large council member, which decided to sort of campaign um, throughout the entire city and wasn't limited to one particular ward. So as a result of that, um, you know, folks sort of kind of knew who I was. And so when they would have issues, um, or challenges, or just you know questions about stuff. They would they would reach out. I always try to make myself available mm -hmm. uh, to address their concerns. Even when I retired off the council several years ago, I still get the calls, <laughs> still get the emails, and still try to be extremely helpful uh, uh, whenever I can. But I think you know to the to the hospital's credit, they're really embarking on an aggressive. Uh, mission of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and this is based on our recognition as an anchor institution within this community. You know, not only the largest employer within the city of Patterson, but the largest employer in the state county. Mm -hmm. And so there's a recognition that, you know, we need to do more um, to engage uh, the members of our host community and make sure that there's opportunities for them uh, within the healthcare sector, but also to ensure that the, the neighborhoods in which we do our work are, are vibrant and striving and how we can contribute to ensure that that happens. Yeah, St. Joe's is doing a, a great job. And I mean, your personal um, civic mindedness has really shaped, you know, Patterson and St. Joe's and all of the the uh, CBOs that you support, specifically the partnership. I know you're part of the Rotary, um, ACPC, United Way. So um, can you talk a little bit more about your commitment to shaping the community and what, what that looks like and anything that we can get involved with? Well, I think, and as you mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate to serve on, on several boards currently today, um, United Way, Rotary, um, I'm also the chair of the um, Patterson Chamber of uh, Commerce, um, still chair of the Ethel Williams Scholarship um, Fund, serve on the Patterson Task Force, um, also chairman of the board of, of Home Care Options. Um, so this maybe, is why you don't have time to enjoy your pool. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so maybe, you know, one, some would argue that I'm spreading myself a little thin, but but, you know, I, you know, I am committed um, to serving, you know, the community and even what I identify as my, my local constituency. And I think this sort of variety with regards to the nonprofit boards that I serve on actually provides me with the benefit of knowing, you know, multiple types of issues and creating those links or pathways for folks need, you know, various needs addressed. Mm -hmm. um, 
as a you know through home care options i could address sort of their, their health care needs in the home house health care needs through united way you know some of the grant and funding concerns um, um through the the patterson y you know some of the needs around children and, and, and housing so it just affords me those those opportunities absolutely it's a really great for the community at large and i know st joseph's is doing st joseph's health um has some specific action steps that they're taking around the social determinants of health looking at housing um, instability employment education and you know, all public safety. Can you share some of those social changes that are happening and how they're impacting the Patterson community? Sure. I mean, like, you know, like modern day hospital, particularly those in, you know, in urban um, communities, as I said earlier, are, you know, by definition, anchor institution. Uh, they're rooted in place and they truly significantly impact the, the neighborhoods. Um, in the communities in which they which in which they reside. So at St. Joseph's part of our Mr. Bridge the Gap of Social and Health Equity, we focus on coordinating community investment activities with the delivery of services to address neighborhoods, environment, environment conditions, um, anything that would literally improve the access of, of health care and to reduce the inequities and health outcomes. Um, currently, we're about to complete our support of housing um, project on Barclay Street. It's 56 units of uh, mixture wow. of one, two, and three bedroom units. Um, the entire first floor is going to be dedicated to um, social services. And these social services um, or support services are going to be tenant driven. So the tenants will decide you know, what type of services that they need with a focus on addressing sort of the, the social indicators of health, which some folks describe as social determinants. You know, I don't like to use the word social determinants because that seems a little too fatalistic to me. I prefer, yeah. you know, that <laughs> social is true. Right. And you know, be those social indicators around, you know, employment, we'll do some parenting, coaching, uh, life skill development and um, financial literacies and things of that nature. So there'll be a whole host of activities for you know the tenants to choose from. I think the one thing um, I wanna make clear is even though that this is an affordable housing project, it will not look like your typical affordable housing project. It's gonna look like a high-end market rate housing project that you will find in any of our suburban uh, neighborhoods, yet the rents will be affordable. You know, right now you're probably looking at less than two thousand dollars a month for a three bedroom unit. Oh wow! Um, there'll be laundry facilities on alternating floors, um, so folks will have access, um, convenient access to doing their laundry. Given the constraints around open space in Patterson in general, there'll be rooftop open space, rooftop gardens and patios for the tenants to enjoy. Mm -hmm. On-site parking. Um, uh, be totally secure building. But more importantly, it's 300 yards away from the hospital's front door. So we'll be able to link those services with hospital services and ensure that those tenants have access to, you know, high quality health care um, as they need it. And, you know, look forward to seeing you at the, the ribbon cutting. You know, I will um, be there 100, 100%. <laughs> I mean, it is just so important. Everything that you named is definitely an indicator of thriving, right? If you can't do your laundry, then that impacts the, the child going to school and being bullied. There are so many emotional and social um, issues that are intertwined with, you know, housing and housing stability. So that that's excellent. So I look forward to being there with you and supporting you. Um, so you said that you have been at St. Joseph's Health for a, a number of decades, which sounds it doesn't look like it. Um, so what still gives you hope? Well, I think what gives me hope is the recognition by um, folks in healthcare leadership that there really needs to be an aggressive push to address, you know, health disparities. And that there's a linkage between health disparities and culture ethnicity and, you know, um, family status, income, and that all has to be taken in consideration. 
and then just a willingness to sort of to listen and not impose on the communities we serve, but to listen and to hear their voice and to ensure that they actually have a voice in which to speak and to not, you know, uh, automatically implement an initiative or a program thinking that it's going to work. Right. But importantly, to, to prototype it, test it, see what works well, see what doesn't work, and then go back and retool it and prototype and test it again until you have something that does work. Also, the uh, recognition that you know, we can't do this work alone, that we have to work with our trusted community partners and community stakeholders uh, to do this work. The housing project that I mentioned earlier, we're doing in partnership with the New Jersey Community Development Corporation. That's one of our key development pro uh, partners, as well as NJ CAPC. You know, so uh, without those trusted partners, it'd be very difficult to do to do a project like this like this. Um, also looking to partner with, with maybe four C's and so forth, because I would really like to have uh, on-site child care within the building itself. So those folks, you know, they have that child care there, they drop them off, they go to work, and they come back, you know, they know they're in a safe environment. And all that comes from truly listening to the voices of, of the communities we serve. Absolutely. And 100%, you do listen to the voices of the community. And we at the partnership can attest to that with our doula program, the um, doula, the Patterson Doula Collaborative mm -hmm. uh, Community of Caring, which you have opened your arms, open labor and delivery, listen to the voice of the people, knowing that doulas is what is needed in the community, those diverse voices to be able to, you know, um, assist in advocating for the patients and making sure the patients are advocating for themselves. Um, I know you have a hard stop, but I just have one more question. Um, we didn't really dive into the International Man of Mystery, but I know that uh, you play many instruments, your love of music and dance. How does your love of music and dance influence your work? Well, I think it, it, it keeps me, I like to think it keeps me creative. And, and, and open to new and innovative ideas. Um, and it also allows me to uh, recognize when um, I don't have all the answers <laughs> and, and, and to know that there are folks uh, that are cl close to me, as well as those folks who may not be as close who may have the right answer. So the willingness to, you know, to engage and, and to listen. But also, um, I like to think it kind of keeps me energetic and, and young in spirit <laughs> uh, um, because it's fun. Uh, I'm actually That's now nice. yeah, uh, taking piano lessons. It is one, oh. it is one of the instruments that I've always wanted to learn how to play, but you know, never got a chance to do it. So now I decided to hunker down and, and, and take piano lessons, but concentrating on classical music. I said, you know, I sort of, kind of got the jazz thing under my belt with my, my saxophone and my, and my flute. So I wanted to really just play um, classical um, music on the piano. And I actually find that to be very relaxing and, and very common uh, playing. Uh, very, very classical. nice. Yeah. Very <laughs> nice. So maybe you will be the star attraction for the 155th anniversary of St. Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you that, the spotlight. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending this half hour with me. I wish we had more time. I hope to you know, speak with you again on Partnership Live, but thank you so much for your time, for your dedication, and you know, for being at St. Joseph's Health and really changing the paradigm for, for that community. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank and you for, for your patience and allow me to sit up on my soapbox for a little while. <laughs> We like it. We'll give you another one. And thank you so much for joining us on Partnership Live. We look forward to seeing you next month. Take care.